Heaven was an important part of Confucius' understanding of the world, yet he had very little to say about it. A detail that helped support the modern West's early opinion that Confucius was unconcerned with a transcendent reality. That interpretation, however, ignored China's traditionally reserved way of relating to the divine world, as well as Confucius' own conviction that his teachings were sanctioned by divine authority. Nonetheless, Confucius' preference to speak infrequently of heaven is remarkable, and it warrants closer scrutiny, especially as we move to discuss his anthropological and ethical viewpoints. As we'll see, Confucius' understanding of human beings helps illuminate why he did not feel compelled to make heaven the subject of lengthy discourse. A clue lies in an anecdote from the Analects. As the story goes, a student approached Confucius to ask how to serve the gods and the ancestors. The master responded, you are not even able to serve your fellow humans. How can you ask about the gods and spirits? When the student went on to ask about death, the master said, you do not even understand life. How can you understand death? As this exchange confirms, Confucius believed that attending to the concerns of this world took precedent over understanding the world beyond. But the story does not suggest that Confucius was only concerned with this world. What it indicates is that attending to the concerns of earth is a prerequisite for comprehending heaven. We must begin with the things nearest to hand before we approach things farther away. He told his protégés, I learned lower things and perceive higher things. Another translator renders the passage this way. In my studies, I start from below and get through to what is up above. By devoting himself to understanding human affairs, Confucius came to know heaven and believed others would as well. Many early Western interpreters failed to grasp this important aspect of Confucius' philosophy, and consequently, they were unable to appreciate the sacred dimension in his thought. For Confucius, the ultimate reality is manifested through the most ordinary things. The higher is revealed through the lower. What is above comes through what is below, and the transcendent saturates the eminent. Accordingly, Confucius recognized the sacred through humanity and saw humanity as sacred. To better appreciate the connection between the sacred and the human, we will devote today's discussion to exploring Confucius's rather complex views about human character and relationship. In spite of the deeply troubled times in which Confucius lived, Confucius had the audacity to believe that human beings were perfectible. Every person, he thought, has the capacity to become a sage, an individual of great compassion and wisdom. Well, that was an astounding conviction when one considers that not much in Confucius's world could be invoked as evidence to support that belief. During the spring and autumn period, one might have been more inclined to conclude that people were just no damn good and utterly unable to reform themselves. Confucius's faith in human possibility, however, was not based on what he saw in the China of his day, but on the study of the great sages of the past and on his own self-awareness. The focus of Confucius' understanding of human character was less on the way human beings are and more on the way he believed we could be. As with his metaphysical views, Confucius was 
less than explicit about what he thought of human nature. His disciple Zikong once complained, the master's cultural achievements, we get to hear about them, but the master's ideas on human nature and the way of heaven, we hardly get to hear them. But the sage did say enough to indicate that he believed that all persons shared a common nature. By nature, he said, people are close to one another. Through practice, they drift far apart. This maxim, by the way, was quoted and affirmed by UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, in its 1950 statement entitled, The Race Question. That document, which was largely drawn up in response to Nazi racial ideology, maintained that all human beings are fundamentally united as members of the same species and that putative racial differences are social fictions, not biological realities. Confucius would agree. Even the people known to the Chinese as barbarians were not considered different by nature. They could always become civilized by the adoption of Chinese mores. Confucius thought human beings come into the world with the same raw material, but the ways we are socialized and conditioned and the choices we make as individuals shape that basic substance into divergent forms. Confucius did not offer an assessment or an analysis of our basic stuff. He did not say whether he considered human nature good or evil but he clearly thought that it could be fashioned in good or evil ways. Humans are malleable creatures. Our natures are such that we can become good, evil, or anything in between. We could say that Confucius viewed humans as unfinished beings whose life work was to bring ourselves to completion. Although human character can be molded in any number of ways, for Confucius, there was only one way worthy of pursuit. Perfect goodness. The master thought that not only was perfect goodness within the realm of human possibility, it was also the will of heaven that we pursue it. The aspiration for moral excellence is, therefore, embedded in the fabric of the universe. Moral goodness lies latent in our human nature and in the urging of heaven itself. For Confucius, to become morally perfect was to attain human fulfillment. Perfect goodness functioned in Confucius's philosophy the way Nibbana or Nirvana functioned in the Buddha's teaching as the person's ultimate completion. We become fully human when we live the most moral life we are capable of achieving. Because perfection was the ideal, the master helped his followers envision this objective and prescribed specific methods to achieve it. Since humans have a great responsibility in cultivating their moral character, we must be very careful about how we shape it. It's not surprising that, for this reason, Confucius directed his contemporaries to look to China's legendary sages as worthy models. In the ancient sages, persons aspiring to moral perfection have both a vision of the destination and a map for the journey. Throughout the Analects, Confucius referred to a wide array of characteristics that he thought were part of the makeup of the morally perfect individual. All told, he must have mentioned two dozen such traits, including respectfulness, refinement, deference, simplicity, and sincerity. The most important among them was run or humaneness, or humanity as it's sometimes translated. 
Yet despite its centrality in Confucian thought, the Analects never fully explains the concept of Ren. Confucius apparently regarded this quality as rather mysterious, perhaps even magical. Fortunately, Confucius did say enough for us to form an impressionistic sense of run. A good place to begin is with the way the word is written in Chinese. In its ordinary sense, run simply means person, and the Chinese character is two strokes that suggest the image of a human being. As a technical term in Confucius's philosophy, run is written by adding the number two to the basic character for person. This addition turns human into humaneness and implies that run is a trait manifested in interpersonal relationships. Some of the alternative English translations such as kindness, benevolence, goodness, and compassion help highlight this relational dimension of this concept. The word noble is also apt because run suggests the quality of an exalted character, perhaps noble humaneness or an uncommon kindness helps get us closer to Confucius's meaning. Although the concept did not originate with him, Confucius was the first to make Run central to his philosophy. He understood Run to be the wellspring of all virtues of the perfect person. To embody this quality in full measure was to attain perfect goodness. Rather than offer a systematic description of the idea, Confucius referred to it obliquely by offering examples of persons who manifested it in their lives. Because he taught about it this way, it's not clear whether Confucius thought run was innate to human nature or an acquired characteristic. Either way, run was a virtue to which one had to aspire, and human beings were endowed by heaven with the capacity to cultivate and nurture it to full expression. One of the clearest expressions of his understanding of humaneness came in a version of the Golden Rule. What you do not wish for yourself, do not impose on others. For Confucius, this principle was based on xu, or reciprocity. Reciprocity is a way of judging what others may want or not want. The master said, the humane person wanting to establish himself helps others establish themselves. And wanting to be successful helps others to be successful. Taking one's own feelings as a guide may be called the method of humaneness. Simply by using our own likes and dislikes as clues, we may imagine what others desire or seek to avoid. We might call this practice empathy. The Buddha called it seeing others as being like yourself. The principle of reciprocity, of course, is only the first step on the way to full humaneness. Not only must we develop a basic sense of what others want and do not want, we must train ourselves to act on that knowledge in a compassionate way. Confucius thought the truly noble person actively promotes the success of others and celebrates their accomplishments. Those of us who have not yet fully realized the virtue of humaneness may recognize, if we are truthful with ourselves, that we often fall short of that standard. Not only do we find it difficult to wish for the success of others, we often take positive delight in their failures. Confucius believed that this schadenfreude 
was a major obstacle to realizing our full humanity and surmounting it required a great effort. Indeed, the very difficulty of such an accomplishment is part of the reason the word noble is so pertinent in discussing the virtue of humaneness. The full expression of Run is accomplished only through great discipline. Confucius also used the language of love to help his followers understand humaneness. For one student, he summarized this virtue by saying, it is to love others. But simply translating run as love has many problems, not the least of which is the way love is so closely associated with romance in the Western world. To connect run and the English word love might be misleading if we do not understand the full context of Confucian teachings. The sage did not believe that the humane person would or even should love everyone equally. He thought that we should love those closest to us more than those farther away. Those who have assisted us the most are the ones most deserving of our love. Since our parents have given us the priceless gift of life, we are obligated to love and care for them the most. The debt we owe them, in fact, is beyond measure and can never really be repaid. The only proper response is reverential love. By affirming the priority of love of one's parents and family, Confucius stayed faithful to Chinese tradition. An old proverb declared that filial piety, the love and veneration of parents, is the first of virtues. In conversations with his protégés, Confucius offered examples of filial behavior. To the traditional duties of the filial child, to feed parents when they are alive, mourn them when they die, and sacrifice to them when the mourning period ends, Confucius added other precepts that went beyond conventional expectations and encouraged the cultivation of noble humaneness. For example, he urged his students to be gentle if they ever found it necessary to correct their parents. If parents resist respectful remonstration, the child must continue to be reverential and express no disobedience or resentment. One must always be patient with one's parents, no matter what. Confucius thought that filiality was not only the most natural form of love, he also believed it was the very basis of all forms of loving. He said, the noble person is concerned with the root, and if the root is firmly planted, the way grows. Filial piety and fraternal duty, surely these are the roots of humaneness. Family life, Confucius might say, is the classroom where we learn to love. Being a good son or a good daughter is the foundation for being a good person. If we cannot learn to love our parents who have given us so much, how can we even hope to love others? Although love of family begins there with the original context, it does not stop in that place. Love of family is the root and not the whole tree. From parents the person of noble humanity next extends love to the members of his or her immediate family and then to the extended family, to friends and to the village, even to the whole province and the whole world, all with decreasing intensity. Confucius did not suggest that we love only those near to us, but we should love those far away less than those close by. Confucius's form of graded love stands in tension with the more universal forms of compassion and love 
espoused by the Buddha and Jesus. It was also at odds with a school of thought in China known as Maoism, established by the philosopher Mozza. When we come to the comparative portion of the course, we will return to this topic to examine these differences in more detail. Humane nobleness, based on the principle of reciprocity and nourished by filial piety, was the essential ingredient in the virtuous life, the life well lived. But it was not the only component of a life of superior character. As mentioned earlier, Confucius discussed more than a few virtues throughout his teachings. Often he spoke of these other characteristics and aspirations in the context of explaining a particular ideal type. Although they were abstractions rather than historical individuals, these ideal persons functioned as saints do in other traditions, providing worthy models for imitation. Indeed, education in ancient China was largely a matter of training in emulation, as much as acquiring knowledge from books. For Confucius, there were several such ideal models. The highest ideal was the sage. The sage represented the complete fulfillment of human potential the person in whom humaneness has been perfected. Although he believed that anyone was capable of becoming one, Confucius also admitted that he had never actually met a sage and had given up hope of ever doing so. He even disavowed the title of sage for himself. Confucius also mentioned the ideals of the good man and the complete man, and often these were associated with particular stations in society. By casting these terms in the male gender, by the way, I'm simply repeating the way that Confucius thought about them. Clearly, he prized patriarchal values in the family and in society. And when he discussed these ideals, he plainly had men in mind. But in terms of the virtues that constitute these saintly persons, there's nothing intrinsically male or female about them. We should bear this point in mind as we examine the ideal type he stressed above all others, the junsa, usually translated as the gentleman or the superior man. The junsa was the highest, not the highest ideal, but it was the ideal for those destined for a political career. Sometimes Junza is translated as scholar official in recognition of its association with government work. Gentleman is probably a better rendering if we bear in mind that it's not to be taken as a generic term for all men, as when the word is written on public restroom doors. For Confucius, gentleman was a specific kind of person, someone who was among other things, courteous and honorable, as in the expression, a gentleman's agreement. A junza was someone who had attained a noble character and superior status by hard work and self-cultivation. Confucius distinguished the junza from the small or petty man. The small person, in contrast to the gentleman, was self-centered narrow thinking, materialistic, and undisciplined. Based on his study of earlier Chinese culture, Confucius maintained that there were certain qualities or traits that were the hallmark of the gentleman. Humaneness, generosity, reciprocity, and filiality were fundamental, of course, but there were others. The gentleman was not only compassionate, but wise. By wisdom, Confucius meant that one knew what was right and what was wrong, and one was a good judge of character and possessed self-knowledge. He told his followers, when you understand something, to recognize that you understand it. But when you do not understand something, to recognize that you do not understand it. That is wisdom. 
The quality of wisdom also meant that one thought for oneself and made independent judgments. A gentleman did not blindly follow others or show partiality. The master said, The gentleman, in his attitude toward all under heaven, neither favors anyone nor disfavors anyone. He keeps close to whoever is righteous. Just as the gentleman displayed impartiality in his dealings with others, he practiced equanimity with respect to all circumstances of his life. Confucius greatly admired one of his protégés for the way he was able to live in near poverty without ever complaining or allowing his situation to dictate his disposition. The disciple lived in a small hut and had only a bowl of rice to eat and a ladle of water to drink each day. Yet, such wretched conditions never ruined his happiness. For Confucius, matters such as living circumstances, wealth, and fame were all determined by heaven and not by the individual. We don't have control over these situations, but we can choose to respond to those circumstances with dignity and nobility. The quality of equanimity pertained also to the opinions of others. In the very first passage of the Analects, Confucius defined this quality according to his usual high standards. Not to be resentful at others' failure to appreciate one. Surely that is to be a true gentleman. In the same section, he took this trait to near the saintly level. It is not the failure of others to appreciate your abilities that should trouble you, but rather your failure to appreciate theirs. To develop such an attitude obviously entails a radical reorientation of the way most of us, I dare say, experience life. Yet, if we can imagine such a possibility, consider the sense of freedom one would have without having to be so self-absorbed. No wonder Confucius characterized the gentleman as self-assured and relaxed. As we noted before, some of his followers found this path a hard one to walk. Discussing the Confucian way with another disciple, Master Zong said, A gentleman must be strong and resolute, for his burden is heavy and the road is long. He takes benevolence as his burden. Is that not heavy? Only with death does the road come to an end. Is that not long? The discipline of striving for goodness is a lifelong process, and in the end, it may not be attained. A gatekeeper who had heard of the reputation of Confucius asked one of his disciples, Is that the Kong who keeps working towards a goal, the realization of which he knows to be hopeless? With no assurance of reward or success, Confucius did ensure that those who took the path of cultivating goodness did so for its own sake and not for any other reason. Confucius said that the man of humanity, first of all, considers what is difficult in the task and then thinks of success. Such a man may be called humane. Today, we have focused on the fundamental aspects of the teachings of Confucius. We have observed how his philosophy is centrally concerned with human character and the importance of shaping it in particular ways that express humaneness, a quality that he believed fulfilled our potential as individual human beings. The responsibility for this development lay, of course, with the individual, 
him or herself. The road was long and difficult, but worth the effort. Taking the hard way was beneficial to oneself and to society at large. In our next lecture, we'll examine how the individual's self-refinement and virtue helped bring harmony and security to the world.